started for you that are jumping on. So tonight we're going to do it a little bit different, more of a podcast, just question and answer. I don't have a fancy slideshow or something that I guess, in my opinion, is a little bit more boring. Um, you know, when we, we walk through slideshows, I've sat through plenty of presentations where the the speaker was able to, you know, they, they taught something, I learned something, but in the end, I didn't really have anything that I could walk away with and say, okay, here's what I can do. And so I did, um, if you look in the chat box, I did share a link. This was also emailed out, um, but just a simple worksheet for you guys to fill out um, as we go through this and kind of we'll walk through the basics of getting started in real estate. So again, I'll give it about one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started and jump in. But again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or in the uh, Q&A, the questions and answers. We'll be watching that. We do want this to be, be interactive as well. Um, so again, it's not just us on a soapbox. Where are you, Jeremy? Are you in the middle of nowhere? I'm at the Maverick in Saratoga Springs, the new one on Redwood Road. I just got out an appointment taking a listing going to help a family relocate to Wyoming. Did you tell them it's cold there? Yeah, I, I, I just told him, I said, dude, nobody goes to Wyoming. It's the other way around. And he laughed yeah. and he said, that's why I'm going there. Okay. And, Fair enough. <laughs> and so like, like I'm from Wyoming. I mean, well, Evanston is more considered Utah than Wyoming, right? But he's going to a little town called Wheatland. Does anybody know where that is? No. It's yeah. north, of north of Cheyenne, about 30, what do you say, 3,600 people? I've never heard of it before. I lived there for a while. You lived there for a while? I did live there okay. for a while. Okay, so you know about it. Yeah, well, I've yeah, been but... all over by Sheridan and Casper and Buffalo and those places, but I've never been by Wheatland. Yeah. So, yeah, he's headed out and wants to be out of Dodge. That'd do it. That'll do it for him. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So, just wanted to put this up real quick. Wanted to introduce our panelists. So first I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Russell Fawcett. I am the Director of Operations on the Stern team. Um, I do own a couple uh, rental properties and the last year have been flipping prop properties with Jeremy Martin. He's on the call. He is one of our lead listing agents on the Stern team as well. And as a partnership, we've been flipping properties. And so tonight kind of we'll take it from the side of the flipper investor and then we have Lonnie Larson. Um, Lonnie, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, I'm Lonnie Larson. I have been in the real estate industry since well, 1982, which makes me old. Um, my interest has always been in investment properties. I own uh, investment properties of my own. Um, but I think the way to build wealth is through owning properties and long term and renting them out because as the economy changes um, and then the rents always go up. 90% of the time the rents go up. So as you keep long term investments, you see an increase in value over time, which I think is how people get wealthy. Okay, sounds good, I appreciate it. And then we also um, have Mandy and Amy from Intercap Lending. So they'll be here to help us figure out how we can finance uh, the long-term investments. Um, so Mandy and Amy, do you want to just introduce yourselves real quick as well? Sure, um, I'm Mandy. I have been, I just call it 20 plus years in the business because it makes me sound younger, Lonnie. 
That's I'll the work game on that. Play. I will work yeah. on that. <laughs> We're just been in the business for 20 plus years. Um, I've done just about every position in the mortgage world and settled as a loan officer about 14 years ago. And it's my favorite because I love working with our clients. So we love, we're seeing a lot of people get into the investment arena because you can make more on in, on your investment properties than you can make in the stock market, in your retirement funds, all those things. So it's been a really fun thing to watch. That's awesome. Um, my name is Amy. I also have been in the mortgage industry about 20 plus years. I have just recently transitioned over to full loan officer, but have done all the roles in between. So still a wealth of knowledge. And um, we are just excited to help answer these questions as they come in and gear you up for your first investment property or your uh, help you grow your portfolio. Awesome. Amy has been working side by side with me for years now. So make no <laughs> mistake. She may be new to the title, but she knows all of the things. Okay. And Jeremy, what else would you like to say about yourself? Um, I've been in real estate since 2014, uh, individual agent, joined the Stern team about three years ago. Um, got into real estate primarily because I wanted to uh, buy and invest in real estate, you know, handle my own properties, that sort of thing. I thought it was kind of like the, the fast track in. Getting into the business, I found out, um, well, step back, I've been in construction for well over 20 years. And to be quite frankly, I hated people. Didn't think I would ever do anything that put me in the service industry like that, right? Just didn't come with, you know, uh, the way I was brought up. But as I got into it, I actually really enjoy helping people buy and sell real estate and accomplish their goals and dreams that way and getting to know them. So um, my personality has changed because of it and I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, but then you know, I, I wanted to get into the investment side of that. So really about a year ago, Russell and I, um, started to take that head on, just took our first leap of faith and went after it and haven't looked back since. So uh, done really well. I sell, um, you know, real estate for the certain team full time and then flip on the side. And then I have a construction background as well. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. We're going to jump in again. If you, if you guys, again, we should have emailed out, you should have gotten your email, kind of the worksheet that I want to go through uh, with you guys tonight, or I did put it in the chat box. You can pull that up. The link's there. So the first thing when investing in real estate, there's so many different ways that you can actually accomplish it. Um, and ultimately kind of with anything, we start out with a goal. And so, you know, Lonnie, what was, what was your goal when you first started and then share with, you know, kind of, kind of where that took you and, and have your goals changed from when you started? So, yeah, I, um, I, when, when I, I've been a real estate agent for all those years, and I, when I first started, I would use my commissions to put down payments on properties and try to do owner finance, which worked really well. My goal in the initially was four properties, um, which I reached in about three years. Um, and, and my thing was to do uh, flips until I could afford a buy and hold. So my flips were my, my kind of um, way to look at it was to say, if I could make more money flipping than I could make by holding it for three years, I would sell it. If I could hold it for three years and collect rent on it for three years, then I would hold it. So um, over, eventually my goal is, was 10 properties because I figured 10 properties coming to rent is pretty good monthly income. And then I got 10 properties and said, you know what, that just isn't enough. So um, went out and have, have continued to pick up long-term properties. I haven't done a flip in a while, which I really want to, but I'm trying not to because it's, it's you know, as a long-term goal, when you're looking for retirement income, at some point, you got to quit buying and start accumulating. Yeah. Did that answer your question? It did. And so as far as, well, I'll go to Jeremy and then we'll get into a little bit more about, you know, your goal with each property and what you're looking for. Jeremy, I mean, what was your goal getting in and, and share, you know, how that might change or what your uh, long-term goal looks like? I think he might have actually froze. You know, it's funny. For, 
because like can you hear me yeah i'm trying to move to a better spot can you hear me yeah yes. okay can you hear you all right sorry about that guys it's i'm in kind of rough service area um when I got into it, I knew I didn't really know what I was going to do. I knew I wanted to invest in real estate because I'd read a book or two, but I really didn't know. I had a brother-in-law that kind of took the plunge and, and got a rental property. And I just looked at him and said, you're a moron. Um, come to find out he was right. And I was wrong. Um, getting into it, I guess my long, my, my thought was, is I would buy the rentals as well and go down that road just because it seemed more um, uh, sustainable, I guess and long-term and just less chaotic. Um, but then as I got into it with my construction background, I like working with my hands, things like that and fixing houses. It just came about one day that I decided I was gonna flip properties because the market was supporting it. Um, and, and I just had an opportunity that just kind of fell into my lap and I jumped on it and just haven't looked back to be honest with you. I didn't really go into it with a real good plan. Um, that's, anybody that knows me is not, knows that's not my strength. I just kind of jump in and go, um, but it just seemed to work out. And um, we flipped, I think, over 10 properties last year. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. So um, on that, you know, as far as my goals, so my goal definitely has been to kind of to chase where Lonnie, you know, I'm where Lonnie was when she started. So, um, you know, Right now, it's about, you know, the flips were to gain capital in order to do the buy and hold. Um, the properties that I have been able to um, hold, the first one actually was my first home I purchased, a, you know, a townhome so that I bought, you know, FHA loan, three and a half percent down. So, you know, it didn't take a lot of money to get into my first rental property. And then from there, you know, with the flips, um, just a little bit of, about it, and we'll we'll go into more detail on the hard money side or on the financing side. You know how how you're able to get rentals, how you're able to to buy the flips, and this isn't necessarily recommendations, um, but it's how Jeremy and I got started. Was we literally neither of us really had much in savings at all, so we went out and got a Home Depot card, we got a Chase card, um, we got a Lowe's credit card. Um, and I had a small home equity line of credit and our first property we did, it was all on credit. And so that is high risk. Um, but we kind of said it, we were to the point where it was, we were gonna figure out a way to do it. And uh, we did figure out a way. So again, there was learning experiences and a lot of risk involved with that, but that's how we were able to do our first one. Um, so going into that, you know, finding your, your property, your next property, let's talk about the criteria. So let's start, Lonnie, what, what makes for you, what was your criteria kind of that first three years when you were buying property and what's your criteria now? Tell us, I mean, you manage rentals, right? So what are, what's a good property? What makes a good rental property? So I have a firm belief that there are good people everywhere. I hear people all the time saying, I will only buy in this neighborhood or that neighborhood or on this side of town or whatever. I believe that there's good properties everywhere. And if you get a good clean property in a nice clean neighborhood and make sure that you um, look over all of your tenants very carefully before you let them move in, that the, some of the best return on investments are not in the high dollar neighborhoods. Um, my criteria are it has to be a, well, early on had to be something I could afford, which you know was pretty low budget, but I, I used my IRA. So I worked in, in the insurance industry for 20 years and had built up my, um, my IRA through them and I cashed it out and did a self-directed IRA and purchased my initial properties through a self-directed IRA. And my criteria are, I, only, I like three to four bedrooms, no more. I like properties with garages um, and I like single family homes because my personal belief is that there's a lot of apartments, a lot of condos, but families, small families, like to throw the kids out in the backyard. So um, that's kind of my niche. I know there's a lot of people who prefer 
you know, who prefer condos because they don't have to worry about yards and that kind of thing. And, and I think there's certainly good to be said about that. But my criteria is it has to, it has to be a nice family home um, in a decent neighborhood. And I don't always have to make a whole bunch of money up front. So if, if I have a payment and the rent doesn't maybe only covers the payment and there's not a lot of cash flow, I'm pretty much okay with that anyway, because with the way a property appreciates, in the long run, you're going to make up that difference and pretty soon it will cash flow. So I know that's maybe not a, what everybody's looking at, but cash flow to me is not king. Value is king when it comes to rental property. Right. And, and a lot of the times I know, you know, a lot of your experienced investors, when they're looking at, you know, big apartment complexes and things like that, they'll talk about like, you know, um, cap rates, net present value. I mean, they, they bring in a lot of these terms. And, and, you know, I remember first starting at, you know, looking into properties and things like that. And it's like, okay, you know, what is the cap rate? How do, how do I evaluate a property? And ultimately for me, I found if I had the goal, if I knew exactly what I wanted to accomplish with the property, it really didn't matter what all those other formulas and things that was like, no, this property, you know, my Salt Lake rental property, um, you know, flat out, I, I am just under a break even every single month. Um, but as I look back at that from the time that I bought it to now, I mean, that property is almost doubled in value, right? And so it was one of those things that, at the time when I bought that property, I was spending a hundred dollars a month putting it into the market because that's all I had. That was all I could save every single month was about a hundred dollars. And, and ultimately, what I when I was evaluating that property was like, yes, this is going to be about a break even. But I I had confidence in the market that I was going to be able. You know, at the end of the year, I looked at that hundred dollars I was investing every month, right? And then all of a sudden I found out $42 of it was going to fees. And so, you know, I was less than 60 bucks a month. And at the end of the year, I was like, well, I didn't really make any money. And I could look at that. And on the other side, if that would have been in the rent, you know, a property that I was renting, the principal, not even accounting for the appreciation, the principal that I was able to gain every single month was going to be more than the hundred dollars that I was putting into that property. And so it made sense for me, but it wasn't about a cap rate. It wasn't about, you know, anything else. It was, can I afford, you know, or am I going to be able to cash flow this, you know, a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, you know, sometimes it definitely is more, but did this help reach my long-term goal? And, and so, I mean, when you buy, are you looking at any of these formulas? Are you crunching numbers? I mean, Oh, or is it a little bit more, can I cash flow it? And this is going to add to my long-term wealth. So when I buy a property, I look at um, all, of, all of what goes into purchasing, of course. I usually look at about 11% that's going to go into the purchase amount. Um, and then I don't do cap rate and all of that. I'm, I'm probably more simple. Mine is just like, okay, if I make... And I only take 10 months of income because you still have taxes and all of that. So, and if you happen to under evaluate it and you get more than that, you know, I'm okay with that too. So um, I'll look at say a thousand dollars a month over 10 months. That's $10,000 that I'm going to make on it this year. What am I going to pay for it? How long is it going to take me to pay off whatever the down payment was? And I don't, I, I have a whole class that I go through all these numbers on and I don't have it in front of me, but the, um, the bottom line is what can you afford now and how much is it going to appreciate? Because if you've got somebody else paying your payment, the rent is paying your payment, then what you've got is appreciation in the amount that the value of the house goes up plus somebody else is paying the mortgage. So it's a win-win. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Let's, let's kind of flip over to, um, I guess, one last question that we had pop up. So, I mean, as far as the age of the home, condition of the home, um, do you take that into consideration? Um, I, uh, the short answer is kind of. 
So I like to buy homes that need some work just because I feel like that's a good value for me because I have, I have some skills and I have some acquaintances who will come in and do that for a good price. If I can get a good price reduction on a house that is not ready to rent and come in and do some rehab on it and make it rent ready, um, I'm looking for that. I don't like really old homes, um, but I rarely buy anything brand new either just because the return on investment isn't as great as it would be if I could get you know, a, a, good, a home in pretty good shape that I can that I can fix up and make it a nice home for a good family for a good price. Okay. And then as far as property management goes, I mean, do you see a lot more repair requests in an older home than you would say, you know, a, a home that's less than 10 years or so? It totally depends on if there's, if there is deferred maintenance, you know, if, if that older home has been kept up, um, the major things, a roof, a furnace, those things are going to be, you know, every 15 years or 30 years, whichever. Um, and so some of that you have to take into consideration. But as a general rule, I don't see a lot of change. Like if you have to replace carpet on a rental property, it's going to be, you know, from about seven years, five, seven years. Um, and that doesn't matter if it's a home that's 35 years old or a home that's 10 years old it's still going to be, it's still the carpet's going to last that long or the flooring's going to last that long. You still have appliances that have a certain life. And if it's, you know, if you bought the house in 1935 that was born in 1935, then maybe it's some of that's been done. So it's, I think it's just a matter of the condition of the home when you buy it and the maintenance as you go along. If there's a lot of deferred maintenance, older houses are going to cost more. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, Jeremy, flipping over to the flip side. I mean, kind of when you're looking at a property that you want to flip, what, I mean, what makes you pull the trigger? What's kind of the criteria you're looking for? Um, I mean, when you, when you look at a property flip, you have to start with the end in mind first and foremost, right? What is the value of the property going to be once I'm done? What can I sell it for? Um, and then you've got to factor in all your math from there. So what am, what am I expecting it? It's going to cost me to repair the property and what that looks like. Then there's always um, us other associated fees that tie into that. Like you have title that you have to pay oftentimes twice, right? When you buy it, when you sell it again, um, agent fees, um, the cost of money, and then my profit, of course. So you take the end in mind, you know, minus all of that backwards. And then we try to build in, you know, on average about a 10% buffer just in case the what ifs. Um, and that, and that's where it comes down to my purchase price. Um, so I think on average right now, we're probably spending about $40,000 to fix a house um, pretty extensively, depending on what each one of it is. And then my profit again. And then um, even though I'm an agent, right, and it, it, I, I still have to pay a buyer's agent on that other side. So that money, that money has to calculate into those costs. Um, so as far as that goes, just with the end in mind, knowing what I can do in the end. Yeah. Well, and I think kind of on that side, as far as our criteria as well, right? So a lot of it is your comfort level in, and we'll talk about developing your team mm -hmm. here in a second. Um, but, you know, going back to our flip, our first property, it was, it was very basic, right? It needed some paint, carpet, a countertop in the kitchen. Um, uh, really, it, it was, you know, a home that was definitely not as old. Um, so it was a little bit easier to get our feet wet um, when flipping. Uh, the other thing that, that I wanted to mention when, I, when I'm looking at properties, I've had a couple that have come across, you know, come across our desk that when you look at it, all the numbers make sense but the home is ugly like flat out it needs a facelift i mean there's one window on the outside of the house and so for me um you know i want to make sure going in that the property has a little bit of curb appeal and that doesn't mean you know flowers and a perfect manicured lawn and things like that i just want some good bones on the outside that when we improve it is going to sell because again there's some of them that, that you look at that are just bad or you go out to the neighborhood and there's you know you go to a neighborhood where the next door neighbor has 12 cars parked you know in front of it and 
you're, you know, or you go in the backyard and there's six dogs barking at you. And it's like, okay, I have to sell this. This is what's going to happen. The, the buyers aren't going to be able to see themselves living there. So it's, right. it's definitely looking at that was like, okay, no, this home's, you know, it looks good. Now let's go fix it to make it even look better um, versus having to completely, you know, cut in windows and things like that. So you can't fix right. the neighborhood either. You cannot fix the neighborhood, whatever the neighborhood is that it is what it is. So it is important right. to get in a decent, you know, a decent area. Well, and not, and not just what goes along with curb appeal also is, is the flow of the house. Also Russell and I walked through one about a month and a half month ago that the, the upstairs flowed really cool. It was great. It was a, a late sixties era house. I think great bones of a home. Um, but the basement was just atrocious. There was no, no matter what you did to it without some serious structural changes, you weren't going to be able to make it flow. So naturally that has effect on the value. It has effect on what you're going to put into it in the end. Um, and whether you can really just make it that great of a house. So even like Russ says, if the numbers line up, not necessarily, not always does the house line up. We had one that we picked up in Ogden, um, that was a crummy little old bungalow. Russ knows I've talked to him about this. I'm not a super big fan of old homes because they always present their own challenges. Um, and I like new and nice as far as that goes. But this house, the location was right down next to the Ogden Rodeo grounds, um, right off the river. Location wise on a cul-de-sac, it was perfect. Um, now we had to take this house, you know, down to the studs, right? And, and redo a lot of things. But in the end, location is what really made it for us. And we were able to redesign the interior um, because it had quite a bit of a functional obsolescence in the kitchen area and our, and use our creativity to make it flow really good. And that was a fantastic sell. Yeah. So ultimately again, kind of just walking through the criteria for our flips, right? Some of the things we have to take in, into consideration. So, uh, we, we take into consideration, obviously the cost to purchase the home. Then we, right now we are still using hard money to finance them. So we have our money costs. Um, then we take our repairs and then there's the other ones. Um, kind of the, again, the first one that I realized after we had purchased it and I hadn't factored in, but the cost of insurance, the cost of, you know, paying utilities every single month, um, kind of my holding costs. Cause I had factored in the, the, you know, all of the, the money costs, the repair costs, but in the end, it was a couple thousand dollars of, you know, title fees and uh, utility fees. And then the insurance, all of a sudden it was a couple thousand dollars. And I was like, oh, I need to start factoring that in when, when we're evaluating, you know, whether we're going to buy it or not. Um, so we take, you know, again, and then the cost of repairs. So we take all of our expenses um, and we add them in. And, and then we literally, so we look at what we could sell it for. We we subtract out how much money we want to make. We subtract out how much it's going to cost us, you know, in expenses and repairs. And that's the amount we offer. And, you know, we get some there. We, we don't get most of them. Um, so again, we're making a lot more offers than we're getting and we just stick to it. It's, you know, we can't fall in love with it and all of a sudden come up because, you know, every single home so far, there's been some type of oops factor, whether, you know, it was all of a sudden um, having to pour in more insulation to a house because it wasn't insulated or, um, you know, just a furnace. a furnace, all of a sudden you're halfway through the rehab and the furnace goes out. Um, there's mm -hmm. always some type of oops factor that, that we didn't calculate in our normal numbers. So we, again, we have our number that we stick to and we make the offer and if we get it, we move forward. If we don't, we move on. So. Yeah, you definitely, it has to be a mathematical decision. It can't be an emotional one. You can't dream your way into making the money. It's gotta be very concise that way. Um, and then time is money. Every time you think it's gonna take you 30 days to do something, I would at least double it, right? Because on hard money and things like that, um, every month, every day you carry the loan, it costs more money. So you have to factor that in as well, um, you know, right to the very, very end. Yep. Okay. Let's go ahead and jump on to the next thing. So again, we, we've set our goal. We've decided what our criteria is. Um, now we got to go out and find it. 
So Lonnie, I mean, how do you find your properties? You know, everywhere. Um, I used to buy a lot of them in on the courthouse steps, and that's a hard way to go. Um, I always go through the MLS very carefully because a lot of people, there's a lot of misinformation that agents will put in the MLS. And so sometimes you can, maybe they won't count the, the basement square footage or they'll get the um, address wrong. So there's not a lot of competition because the information is incorrect. And if you go in and find that and there's not a lot of competition in it, sometimes you can make a good deal there. Um, I work through um, other investors who go out and actually shop for the properties and then make $5,000 because they don't have the money to put down on them. Um, I buy them from other you know, owners who don't want to play the rent game anymore. They want to sell their property. Um, Really, I think you have to kind of cast a broad net and get everything out there that you can possibly look at and then kind of narrow it down in from there. Okay. What about you, Jeremy? How do you find your properties? Um, you know, first and foremost, it started with me with mindset, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I, I've sold a lot of homes and naturally being in the real estate, it's a little bit easier for me. But I've sold a lot of homes that would have been great flips. Right. But I didn't recognize that at all until I actually started thinking in that mindset. Then all of a sudden, everything became a good flip right at that point. Um, but what I'm learning as I do this more and more and more, uh, it, it's like Lonnie said, is, is a broad net for sure, having lots of tools in your bag. But I find that networking, getting in touch with people, putting it out to the universe that, that I am an investor and I buy these properties. Um, little by little by little, I start to come in contact with more people that are reaching out to me, you know, or that sort of thing. Um, I think if you just put it out there and, and make it well known and, and get in that world, th then they can, and at some point start to come to you rather than you having to always chase them. Um, I was talking to a young man right now that, um, honestly, I'm working out, we'll probably end up purchasing his property tomorrow, um, that, uh, he's door knocking, right? He's out knocking doors. Um, looking for people that want to sell their property. Um, and he's got two or three on the line and he just barely started doing it. Um, and uh, so that's one avenue. Uh, I know the, the Utah, what's the name of that web, that, that group, Russ, Utah uh, Investors. Salt Lake Investors Association. Yeah, yeah, that one. Um, I know that there's a lot of networking and stuff that goes on with that. That's a great setup. And really just start rubbing shoulders with people who are in that world because you never know who's actually doing it. If you don't start talking about it, then nobody will know, right? You're, now you're the invisible investor and, and it will never come your way. So you have to kind of create that opportunity to knock on your door. Right. And, and kind of for me, I mean, as I look back at where we've been able to acquire some of our properties, um, it does come from that investor network, right? Um, it, it comes from talking with people, um, having a real estate agent, as well, because I mean, they they'll come across people. I mean, just like you, you have properties that you come across, um, you know, that that would possibly be a good flip, and maybe you know you're not buying it, or it doesn't quite meet what you're looking for, but it meets what another investor is looking for, or maybe you, it's not a flip, right? So maybe the numbers don't quite work on a flip, but it would work for a long term buy and hold, you know, because. Mm -hmm. On a flip, you're looking, you know, 20, 30% discount, um, where on a buy and hold, maybe your number is five to 10%, you know, off of retail to make the numbers work. And so really networking and honestly, you know, as far as us on our flips, um, and, and it kind of works for both, both, you know, buy and hold or flips are wholesalers. You know, there's a lot of them that go to investor associations, but more and more we are seeing companies that are spending a ton of money to, you know, market themselves as as cash buyers, but they're actually not cash buyers. They're they're wholesaling the property, so they're going in, they're putting a contract in place, and then selling their contract. And we've it, you know, we've bought more properties honestly that way than any of the other you know avenues that we've looked at. And it's just because they are doing more to advertise and get out. And, you know, so again, it, it comes back to, um, you know, just networking on that. And so we did have a question as far as what is the amount of money you look to make on a flip? 
So for, for Jeremy and I, our number is $20,000. Um, that is, we've found that to kind of be the sweet spot to make sure we don't lose money because we've had some that we've, you know, came pretty close to breaking even. And then we've had some that we've made more money than that, but we feel like that's kind of our buffer. Lonnie. Hey, Russ, I, d I just wanted to make one point about what you were talking about just a second ago. And that is the wholesalers who they, they, that's their whole business is to go beat the streets and come up with additional um, properties. But I just wanted to make sure that uh, every time you talk with a wholesaler, they will indicate that this is the resale value. So here's, here's what you can buy it for. You can make $50,000 because this is the resale value once it's been repaired. And I just want to caution people to do their own research on what that actual resale value is. Yes. Because a lot of times those are inflated. Uh, every time they're inflated. <laughs> I don't think that I've seen one that wasn't inflated. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, it, as far as, um, again, that's, I guess, I'm answering the question, $20,000 total is what we, uh, you know, so it's not 20,000 each. We're not trying to make 40,000 a property. Our minimum is 20. I do know investors that they won't buy properties uh, if they're not going to make $50,000. And I like to network them with them because, you know, they can take the home runs. I'll take the base hits um, and, and continue to work with them. But again, um, make sure if you're looking, if you want to start, you know, buying some of these in investor properties, uh, real estate agents, you know, we're in the business, uh, property management companies, and then, you know, getting out and networking with the investors, um, you know, trying to, to just put it out there that that's what you're looking for. And again, as Jeremy said, a lot of that comes down to mindset. Um, let's go ahead and keep going. So the next part, um, you know, so we find the property, how are we going to buy it? And so let's go ahead and talk, you know, on the rental side, we'll bring in Mandy and Amy a little bit. Um, on just kind of a traditional, I want to save money and buy an investment property. What does that look like? So part of that depends on what type of property, right? Yeah. I don't know if you guys have talked about things like single family residents and duplexes and triplexes and all those things that does change the game a little bit, but say you're buying a single family residence, you need a minimum of 15% down. Most people believe that that is 20% down. That is because that's kind of the general general advice given because mortgage insurance is not cheap on them unless you have very high credit scores. So you can do it with as little as 15% down. 20% uh, down is preferable. And I will tell you, you get your best interest rates at 25% down. And when I say best interest rates, it's roughly a half point cheaper in interest rate. I've seen as high as 0.75 less expensive. So it over time that could add up. Having said that, it's a 5% down is often a good chunk of money out of your working capital. So that may not be an option, but something to know. You're looking rate wise, you're looking right now anywhere from the low threes if you have 20%, 25% down up to the mid high threes if you have 20. Um, if you start getting into multiple units, that changes the game pretty substantially and you need a lot more money down. So you need 20% down minimum for a duplex. If you go three to four unit, you have to have 30% down. So keep that in mind. And I don't know, Lonnie, you can, I don't know if you own multiple unit. And do you I like do single that? family. That's just my niche. I like single family homes. I have a couple of duplexes, but my preference is single family. Okay. Um, we are seeing a question about whether or not the 15% can, can come from a, a refinance. Yes, you can pull your 15% from a secured asset. So if you have another property that has that much equity, you can certainly do that. That is a way to get a hold of those funds. Now, the other thing that you need to have as far as funds, this tends to be you know, the big sticking point for people when they go to do investment properties. Not only do you have to have a pretty decent down payment, you also have to have reserves. So depending on your credit score and your um, debt ratios, Assuming that you keep your debt ratios under 43% and you have, you know, mid to high 700 scores, you need six months reserves. So six months of whatever that new mortgage payment will be after your down payments, right? 
if your credit scores that so the lowest credit score that you can have and get investment financing is actually a 680 so that's important to know and if you're in that 680 range you'll be required to have 12 months reserves so keep that in mind because that's a substantial chunk of money okay and then lonnie what do you find i mean so that's that's on the lending side as far as you know what's required to have in reserves do you have something where you know it's it's i you know i need this much in reserves for for each rental property that i own well it, you know as you own more and more properties you have more flexibility with that but so if you have one property and it doesn't get rented for a month then you don't have that payment but if you have multiple properties and you know one can kind of feed the other but i always like to make sure that you have a, no less than, you know, a minimum of maybe three months that you can bank borrowers steal. Um, I, I've never had a scenario when all the properties were banking at the same time. So that's a bonus. But especially if you have one or two properties, I would make sure you have no less than three months. And I think six months is a far better, far better way to go. And then on your single family homes, on average, how much are you finding they do you have kind of a number or on average how much in repairs someone can expect in a year? Yeah, so the average is 1% of the value of the home. And that's across the board. So if you have a $250,000 home, you can anticipate a minimum of about $2,500 a year. If you have a million dollar home, you know, everything costs more, everything is bigger. So you're going to see that that 1% still kind of take effect. But as a general rule, I always look at approximately 1%. So if you have to replace maybe one year, you don't have that. But if you put that away until you have to replace a roof, then, you know, it just kind of across the board, that 1% of the value of the home is, is a real good standby. Okay. And then Mandy, going back, so a couple other scenarios, I guess. Um, one we talked about. So tell us a little bit more about if we have equity in our primary residence, how can we tap into that equity to be able to buy another property? Now, uh, so for me, I moved out of my property, right? I, I left that one alone and went and, um, and, and purchased another property as opposed to pulling the equity from my house. But Tell us, I guess, a little bit, you know, how does that look like if I have a primary loan on, or a primary residence loan, how long do I have to be in my house before I can go out and buy another primary residence? Or, you know, how do I tap into the equity of my current house? Yeah, so uh, the version that you're talking about, Russ, is honestly the most common that we see, especially for people picking up their first investment property. Most people, their first home is something that is probably pretty rentable and it makes a really easy transition because you can go buy a new home as a primary residence and do a minimum down payment of 5% and turn your old property into an investment property. So we see a lot of that and it's a really good fix for, for a lot of people that don't have the substantial reserves behind them yet. Um, if you are wanting to keep your current property and truly do a traditional investment property purchase, you can do, you can pull equity from your house a couple of ways. You can do it as a cash out refinance. So depending on what terms you're already at, it may make sense to do a refinance, pull a chunk of money out to cover the down payment on the next property, or you can do a home equity line of credit. So keep in mind a cash out refinance, your interest rate is going to be slightly higher. It is higher risk to an investor. So if you have already refinanced and you're sitting in the mid twos, you may not want to mess with your primary financing. You may want to do a home equity line instead. The upside to a home equity line is it's a continual, it's a renewable resource, right? So as you pay that down, you could then use it to buy yet another property. So keep that in mind. Now, Russ, asked a question about, so say I buy a property and I'm going to live in it, how long do I have to live in it before I can rent it? You will hear most people will tell you a year. Um, that is kind of just a general rule of thumb because underwriters get really sticky if you don't stay in it at least a, a decent amount of time. Legally, the deed of trust says intent to occupy. So 
if you were to buy a condo, move into it, live in it for eight months, and then decide to go build a home or go do something else, probably no, no one's going to say anything about it. What you don't want to do is buy a home, move into it as your primary residence, and turn around and go under contract on a new place 30 days later. The investors will get really, really picky about that. So as long as it kind of makes sense, you're not gonna get pushed too much. Okay, and then as far as, let's say that I wanna look at a property that is either a duplex or maybe even a mother-in-law, or maybe I just wanna rent out some bedrooms. Like at what point can I count the money that I'm going to make on the rental as income to be able to qualify for that purchase? Your I mean, next piece of financing, yeah. So room rental, you cannot. So let's just take that one out. Uh, if you own a property that has a mother-in-law apartment, if you own it and you have been renting out that mother-in-law and you are reflecting that on your tax returns, that you can use, but you will have to have it on your tax returns. If you are buying a new property with a mother-in-law, you cannot count that mother-in-law as separate income because unless that house is zoned for multifamily. So unless it is legally zoned to have two unit, you can only count one lease agreement as your income to qualify. Okay, if you're buying two unit, three unit, four unit, you can, you can actually occupy the property and count the other units as qualifying income. Um, beware as you get into the three and the four unit, they start to look more at whether or not the property itself will cash flow with or without you. So you will hit additional restrictions on reserves and, and what those numbers look like. But there are ways to do that. Okay. And then Lonnie, let's say that I want to buy a property um, that is not a legal duplex. So, you know, it's got a mother-in-law. I want to buy that, you know, as my primary residence to start out with. Are there any issues with then eventually me moving out and renting, you know, both units if it's not zoned to duplex? So it's getting easier. Um, a couple years ago, it was pretty stiff because the neighbors always tell on you, you know, if, if there's cars in the driveway that don't belong there too often, or if they're blocking the roadway or anything like that, the neighbors always tell on you. Um, because of our shortage of housing, we're seeing less issues with that. So the things to look for, if you are going to consider doing that, is you always have to have an absolutely open separate entrance so that there is no entrance from like the down upstairs into the downstairs and you have to have additional parking available not on the street so those are kind of the things that a tenant's going to look for it's going to make it really hard to rent a mother-in-law apartment if you have to come in through the front door go through the kitchen and down to the basement from there so there are some specifics and depending on the neighborhood, you're going to get more pushback than in some areas than others. But legally, legally, there's still a legal duplex versus a mother-in-law. But because of our recent house and sh housing shortage, they are a lot more open-minded about just a regular mother-in-law rather than you know a legal split. Okay. And then what about I mean renting out rooms individually, buying a single-family home and then renting them out individually. Uh, that I don't get involved in that at all. Um, and, you know, I, personally, I don't think it's a great idea, but that's just my personal opinion. Yep. From, a, from a lending standpoint, if you had that going on, we'll only take one lease agreement towards your qualification. So keep that in mind. They, they don't love the room rental plan. Okay. We see it a lot around the universities, but you're better off if you can get one lease and they happen to have multiple tenants as part of their lease. Okay. And we are coming, you know, we have about 10 minutes left. So these last couple that we'll probably have to go through rather quickly, um, you know, and I think it'll be good to probably have another discussion, you know, another time just about financing. Cause I think that can, I mean, there's a lot of questions around that. How do I qualify? How do I get in? Um, so on our flip properties, um, you know, we, we buy those hard money. And so what that is, essentially, it's, it's not using a traditional lender, a bank, um, but there are some companies out there, individuals, that lend us money. And so typically your, your hard money costs, you're going to see usually they're at least 12% per year. Um, and then you're going to pay anywhere from two to six 
uh, percent up front. So just to buy it, just to get the loan, you're usually, you know, two to four percent. Um, and then also it can be all the way, again, the yearly interest, most hard money lenders, you can find them. They'll, they'll loan it about 12%, but that's why you have to definitely take that into consideration in your numbers. And then the other one that, again, we could have a whole class on it and just wanted to touch real quickly is, um, you know, seller financing. And that's where you leave the current, uh, you know, loan in place or maybe they've paid it off um, and you work with that. So that's something that, you know, then you make payments to the seller or you use a third party company that pays the seller and pays the underlying mortgage. So again, that's a whole nother class that we'll have to, to go into but it's, it's a great way that you can also sometimes create a win-win situation where you're able to get a, help a seller out of a hard situation, keep their mortgage payments current, but not have to go through traditional financing. Lani. Yeah, as long as you're aware that 99% of those loans are listed as, um, once they sell them, you have to, if, if, if the loan, if the bank calls the loan due, you have to make an immediate payment of whatever that balance is. Yep. It doesn't happen very often, but it, they certainly have the right to call it. Yep, because mo um, almost every loan definitely has a due on sale clause, or like you said, if the loan even is transferred, um, sometimes, um, you know, they'll call, they could call it as well. Um, and then as far as Mandy, on, on uh, investment properties, how many loans can you have in your name before it gets messy? It's a really good question. So once you hit nine properties, if more than five of them are financed, you're going to have problems financing. Okay. So what do it I do? It's really, really ugly at that point. Okay. So then at that point we call and we have an in-depth conversation with you, right? So yep. how do we, there are, there are ways, but it gets really hard at that point. They don't, they don't like to see people have more than that. Um, it, it gets easier if part of them are own free and clear, right? What they really care about is how far you're extended. So if you, you know, if you have 11 properties, but you only have mortgages on three, you're going to be fine. But as you get up into that four to five properties finance, it starts to get really complicated. Okay. And then again, interest rates for our investment properties, where do they stand right around right now? So if you've got high, mid to high 700 scores, if you put 25% down on single family residence, we're locking at three and an eighth today. If you are putting 20% down, you're looking more at 3.625. Okay. And then if I found a property that I needed to close quickly with cash, so let's say I, I did a hard money loan um, and I closed that, or maybe even did it as seller finance, um, is it easy to refinance out of that or do I have to wait a long time? And what does that look like? There are some nuances to that. That's a great question. So say you come up with a hard money loan and you go into it and you buy it cash quickly and then you want your money back out. There are two ways to do that. Um, the easiest way is for you to have an entity record a deed against that property for whatever amount you want to pull back out. Keeping in mind, of course, that you cannot go past 80% in a cash out refinance. Um, so that's the easiest way because then it is not considered cash out, it's considered a rate and term refinance, you're paying off a lien to another entity. The other way, you can pull a cash out on that property. You have a finite window uh, after it closes of about 90 days and you have to document every dollar that you put into it in order to pull it back out. It is much more difficult to go that route. So if you, you know, most people who are buying investment properties have entities you know, have your company hold a note against the property and pay off that note. It's an easier way to go. Got it. Okay, and then kind of just to wrap up a couple of these next things. So, and I'll kind of group the, the two together. After I've bought the property, um, you know, why, why, would, why would I go with property management over, I mean, doing it myself? I mean, what are the surprises that I'm looking at, you know, when I buy a property, because I know you guys obviously have a huge network, right? Talk about the network that I would need to manage the property myself. 
So, well, of course, you're going to have all the network people, plumber, I mean, all the repair people, plumbers, um, painters, roofers, you need to have all of that in your back pocket. You also have to be um, willing to go and get caught. My favorite are the calls at, you know, 1130 at night that says, well, it's 23 degrees outside and my furnace has gone out. Um, that one's a favorite, happens all the time. Or my bathtub is overflowing. Or, I mean, those are the kind of horror stories that people hear all the time. Another thing that you really need to do that people kind of overlook is you need to do an ongoing inspection of the property every few months, whatever you can live with. But it's just like when, when your neighbor comes over to your house, you know, if people are coming all the time and they, you know they're looking, you're gonna have a cleaner house. If nobody ever checks on you to see how it's going, they can get pretty shabby pretty quick. So all of those things, in addition, you're gonna need somebody to, do, to write your advertising, take your photography, um, answer your phone when those calls come in, um, take care of all the finances. You also have to do um, your own taxes on that. You've got to have a tax attorney to get that taken care of for you. Um, and, and, and you honestly, it takes a certain kind of personality to say, I'm not going to, I want to pick my own charities. My tenant who says he can't pay his rent this month or whatever is not going to be my charity. I pick my own charities. They don't get to pick them for me. So I think that's where property management comes in is because they have all the tools and systems to make that easy for you. And, you know, honestly, that cost is a tax deductible cost. So what I tell people a lot of times is if your property is vacant for one month because you can't get out and show it at the time that people want to look at it or you can't advertise it effectively or any of that, you have paid for a property manager for almost a year. So it's kind of how much is your time worth and how much is the hassle worth? Gotcha. And do, have you built the network, right? I oh, mean, exactly. So yeah. if I don't know a plumber and, you know, the plumbing goes out in the middle of the night, a uh, toilet overflows, or like you said, the gas company goes, or the, the furnace goes out and I don't even have an HVAC guy to call. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a lot easier to have that um, put in place. Well, and honestly, and especially in this kind of a market, because all of those people are so busy, if they don't know you and you call up and say, hey, I need somebody to come here, you know, immediately, they're going to say, okay, my calendar says I can be there in about three weeks. So, I mean, that's a huge issue that's going on right now. Okay. And then as far as um, kind of the last thing, and we'll wrap up and then, you know, get some final thoughts from any of you guys. Um exit strategies. Let's talk about that real quick. With the flips, it's pretty pretty easy, right? So um, we know our exit strategy going in. We want to flip the property. We determine the ARV. On your rentals, I mean, I guess this probably just comes down to your ultimate goal, right? Your finance goal. So how do you know when it's time to sell? How? When do you get out of the property? So that's such an interesting question because I don't know. Um, I get out of it when, it when it's bugging me. It's like I'm trying to sell a property right now just because it's bugging me. It's good investment. It's a good property. It's got tenants in there long term, but I hate the house. So I'm probably going to sell it. Um, and then I guess, you know, with my heirs don't want my, my investment properties when I die, we'll have to sell them off. Yeah. No, that's, that's what I feel as far as an extra strategy, right? The only time that I think I would sell is if I could move up to another property that might, you know, I, maybe I decide, okay, this one doesn't cash flow or isn't appreciating like I, I want. So I want to buy another property with it. But ultimately, I know for my goal and, you know, Jeremy, we've talked that I want to build a portfolio that I keep forever. I mean, it'll be up to my kids to decide what the exit strategy is because yeah. you know, it's going to be. Yeah, we're we're going to burden them with all them problems. We're just going to live and have fun right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Well, it is seven o'clock. I appreciate you guys taking time, you know, out of your evening to answer the questions. Um, again, I know this was fairly basic, but I think the overall goal that I had with this tonight is you don't have to have millions of dollars in the bank to get started in investing in real estate. Again, uh, we honestly, my first home I bought with next to nothing. Um, my first, you know, 
uh, flip property. I was highly leveraged and got in. So really, you know, it comes down to that mindset of, of making the decision that I'm going to get into real estate investing. And if you don't know, um, you know, how to do it, then reach out to us. Let us be your resource to help you get off the fence and take that first that first step um, because it is a way that you can build wealth. Um, you know, and especially over the last couple of years here in Utah, seeing double digit appreciation, um, you know, people are building wealth right now. And so it's something that even though, you know, it feels tough to buy a property sometimes or tough to find a deal, reach out to the professionals, reach out to people that do it full time that can help you find those properties that can teach you what it's going to take to get in the property and leverage us to help you get into those properties. But again, thank you guys, Lonnie, anything else that you have for us? Any, anything to help us get over our fears of jumping in the game? You know what? The good ones go fast. So if you want a good one, get in there and be ready to jump, do your homework, do your due diligence, but do it quick because the good ones go quick. And if you want to, if you want to get into the game, I say, you know, don't let fear keep you out. Jump in there. Yeah, over analysis causes paralysis, and you'll just stand still forever. Yep. Okay, Mandy, Amy, anything? I mean, anything we should be scared on on the lending side that keeps us out? I mean, what do we need to do? No, I, I really think, you know, a sweet spot for a lot of people making that first entry point into investment property is to turn your current property into your investment property. You get to count the new lease that, and you can have the lease written with a start date past when you move out and you're closing on your, your new home. You can count the lease on that to help offset the payments. It's, it's a really clean way to get your first investment property. It's a very affordable way to enter. Right. Jeremy, any parting words for us? You know, for me, it, it's just keep it simple. Um, you know, rub shoulders with who you can. Just put it out to the world that you want to invest. Um, even if you don't have a great plan and a great strategy, if you talk to and meet enough people, um, something will come your way, right? And then when it seems to make sense to you, then take it. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thank you guys again. Thank you to all of our in attendees that, you know, took some of their time out of their evening to invest with us. We will make sure that we send an email out to everyone with uh, the contact information for Lonnie, Mandy, and Amy, uh, Jeremy, and myself. So that if you do have additional questions that maybe weren't, we weren't able to answer tonight, they reach out to us. Uh, we want to be your resource for you. But again, thank you again, and hope you guys have a good evening. Thank you. It was a it was a treat. Okay, thank you much. Thanks for having us. Everybody have a great night. Thanks. See ya. Yeah.